Ma. Why, what on earth are you... Julie, my dear? There's something you might as well know before these terrible people from the North burst in on us. Well, why did you ask them to stay here? It was in the contract. Contract? I assure you, child, it was no pleasure for me to be forced to sell the story of your great-grandfather's life for common actors to perform before the gaping public. I'm not blaming you, Mama. After all, great-grandfather Britt Conway's memory belongs in a way to all the world. It does nothing of the sort. Britt Conway's memory belongs exclusively to this branch of the family. Yes, of course. Is that about great-grandfather? It's his private diary. I didn't know that he... No one but I knows what it contains, and nobody else will know, especially those busybodies from New York. I intend to destroy it. Oh, Mama! If they wish to write about his songs, or the more respectable of his verses, that's their affair. But I refuse to have his indiscretions paraded before the public. With my great-grandfather indiscreet, Everybody's great-grandfather was indiscreet. Your great-grandfather was indiscreet enough to write down his indiscretions. Mama, mm -hmm. may I read the diary before you dispose of it? <laughs> it would be of no interest to a well-brought-up young lady. Oh, yes, it would. And besides, I'm old enough to read almost anything now, except bits of Shakespeare. Anyway, how can I deny all those rumors in Battenville about great-grandfather, unless I know the real truth? And you know I'll Mr. be... Charles. There's some foreigners here asking for you. Foreigners? Yes, and Mr. Sure thing they ain't from Louisiana. Oh, well, that must be Mr. and Mrs. Kimbrough and, and Mr. Mont. Yes, and that's what they say the name to. Show them in, Liza Henry. Yes, and Miss Charlie. I look awful. Mama, I promise to read only the nice bits. I'll go out this way so I won't run into any of Liza Henry's foreigners. And if we don't find it? There'll be no play. George. Oh, yes, my love. Straighten your tie. You look like something out of a circus. What's wrong with circuses? Nothing, old man. I barked with Freak Show on the Rex Evans outfit last season. Wonderful people and quite out of the ordinary. If you're looking for a plot for one of your pictures, Mr. Mr. Mark, I've got... she receives you all now. It's very kind of her, I'm sure. Keeping us all waiting like servants. An unfortunate simile, Valerie. Servants these days don't wait. Come on, George. There you are, my little man. Thank you, Mr. Kimbrough. And uh, stick around. I have a hunch we'll be going back to the planter's house. Okay. How do you do? You must be Mrs. Kimbrough. Welcome to Battenville. How do you do, Mrs. Charteris? This is my husband, George. This is my husband, George Kimbrough. The playwright. How do you do? Oh, yes, and Stephen Mott, his assistant. How do you do, how Mrs. Do you do? Charters? I can't tell you how grateful we are to you for allowing us to invade your privacy this way. Are you from the South, Mr. Mott? No, why? You have such nice manners. Thanks. My dear, you're going to be positively inspired in this quaint old room. Mrs. Charters, your home is perfectly charming. It simply reeks with atmosphere. Of course, the first thing we have to do is move that writing desk over there. So the light comes over his left shoulder. My husband is so particular when he's working, everything has to be just so. But that's genius for you. I'm afraid, Mrs. Kimber, your husband will have to exercise his genius in some other room. The arrangement of this furniture has not been altered since my grandfather, Britt Conway's death. That's very interesting. Did the old boy die here? The old boy, as you choose to call him, was killed in a duel defending the honor of his family. How boring. None of my family. Possibly none of your family had any honor to defend, Mrs. Kimbrough. Any day you want a job as a dialogue writer in Hollywood, Mrs. Jodderis, just let me know. Thank you, young man. I'll remember that. I'll send for Liza Henry to show you to your rooms. I've given you and Mr. Kimbrough the blue bedroom. It used to be Britt Conway's. I bet you'll get a great kick out of sleeping in George. And you're in the West Room. It used to be my daughter Julie's school room. Sounds delightful. Charming. And where will my husband write? There's a perfectly good writing desk in the Blue Room. Well, it was good enough for Grandfather Britt to write his... His what, Mrs. Charles? His verses, of course. I'm afraid there is no other spare room in the house except a small room in the attic that used to be the butler's when we had a butler. You wouldn't mind taking the butler's room, would you, Steve, dear? 
You know how desperately important it is for George to be completely undisturbed. Really, Valerie? I mean, of course, for the two of you to be completely undisturbed. I don't mind a bit. That is, if the switchover doesn't cause you too much trouble. Not at all. Would you kindly ring the bell, Mr. Kimber? I'll have Liza Henry prepare the room. I'm afraid it'll take her some little time. Oh, well, that's perfectly all right. While the others are settling in, I'll take this opportunity, if I may, to stroll around your lovely garden. I'll come with you, Steve. There are one or two points of construction I must discuss with you. No, George. We must fix up your study, mustn't we? Men are such children, aren't they, dear Mrs. Charteris? Harmless, but children. I wish I could say the same of women. You rang, ma'am? Yes, Liza Henry. January 14th, 1859. Eleven more days until my beloved Marceline returns from her tour. Each day will seem a full year. To pass this interminable period, I have started to compose a ballad to be danced. I have chosen the power at Lafitte as my subject. Marceline will be adorable as Queen of the Mardi Gras, dancing enchantingly as Lafitte sings. The other by you call, saying love is all. Never think about tomorrow or yesterday. This madness we're sharing will live through the night. No thinking or caring. Sorry to disturb you. Oh, no, you didn't. Are you Mr. Kimbrough? No. I'm the Mont half of our disreputable collaboration. Steve Mont. How do you do? Uh, I'm... Miss Charteris. Miss Julie Charteris. Not only the great-granddaughter of the famous Britt Conway, but obviously a very charming young lady in her own right. Won't you sit down? Thanks. Are you from the South, Mr. Mont? Does I have such nice manners? No. Because you pay such fulsome compliments. <laughs> You've inherited your mother's gift of repartee. Say, that's an attractive tune. Britt Conway wrote it. Isn't the music box pretty? It was given to him when he married my great-grandmother. Lovely. How do the words go? No one knows. Britt left no record of them. You mind if I take the music box with me and have a shot at writing lyrics to the tune? Of course not. Only... Only what? Mr. Mont. Steve, to a fellow author. Mr. Mont, I want to ask you a question. Which I'll do my best to answer, providing you call me Steve. Well, then, Steve, what sort of a man are you going to turn my great-grandfather into? In the play, I mean. Well, uh, an interesting one, I hope. Oh. Well, that's what I was afraid of. Why? Well, you see, Mother doesn't approve of interesting men. And you, Miss Julie? Oh, I like them. Well, isn't it possible to write a play about a good man and make it interesting, too? Like, uh, well, like Jefferson Davis or Woodrow Wilson. Was Brett like Jeff Davis or Wilson? No, not very. What was he like? Well, you saw his portrait in the drawing room. I didn't believe for one minute that was Britt Conway. Well, I'll have you know that that portrait was painted by a gentleman who comes from one of the first families in Louisiana. It looks like it. I take it back. You're a typical Yankee. Good. I like to see a bit of the Conway flare up in you. It's very becoming. You know nothing about Britt Conway. And I have a feeling that nobody around here wants to give me any information about him. No scandal, if that's what you mean. <laughs> Darling, uh, don't you think those things are a trifle short? Well, long or short, they're better than the rags that were hanging here. Don't you think the whole effect is rather chick? I guess it's very artistic. The only thing is, it makes me feel dizzy. Always the enthusiastic husband. Always give the little woman a pat on the back. If you ever said anything halfway decent to me, I'd fall right on my face on the floor. You love it. This here's Miss Julie's schoolroom. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it was Miss Julie's schoolroom. Supper's at seven, if y'all feel strong enough. If you're all through with the decorating, ma'am, I have to be getting back to the planter's house. Yes, well, run along, young man. Oh, and, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimbrough. You know, I've seen you somewhere before. It couldn't have been... No, it couldn't have. Besides, we hardly move in the same circles, do we? I don't move in circles at all. I come straight to the point. Looks like old times to see Valerie's drapes up again. You remember the last time, George? Sure. It was in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, when we were trying out Tenderly Yours. <laughs> and some old dame popped in, thought we were running a fortune-telling parlor. Oh, 
if that's the kind of humor you brought back from Hollywood, I only hope you won't persuade George to use it in the new play. And certainly not in my role. Talking of that, were you able to get any information out of the old dame? Not a thing, either from the mother or the daughter. What's she like? Uh, the daughter, I mean. Oh, all right, I suppose. Not your type at all. What do you mean, not George's type? Well, I mean, not like you. You are George's type, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> well, come along, George. If supper's to be at seven, we have to tidy ourselves up. You go ahead, dear, and I'll be along in a minute. There's something about your part in the play that I must discuss with Steve before I forget it. Oh, all right. I'll allow you five minutes. Steve, you're not to give George anything to drink. He's given alcohol up completely since you went away to Hollywood, and I'm not going to have that starting again. Where would I have a drink on me to give George? I don't know, but I want you both to remember that we're going to lead normal, healthy, country lives as long as we have to stay in this quaint old morgue. And I haven't got a drink on me. Don't you bother your pretty little head about it. Say, she hasn't really reformed you, has she? I can work with almost anybody, but I draw the line at a reformed drunkard. Just a minute, brother. The gentleman in the audience asked for scotch. And here it is. Very ingenious, maestro. Anytime you want anything to drink, just ask, name a drink, Kimbrough, and he will fix it for you. I can see neither your brains nor your throat have been rusting during my absence. Here's to you. Byron over there is full of gin. No kidding. Have another? Sure will. Now we're getting into the spirit of it. You know, Steve, I really believe that with Shakespeare and Byron to inspire us, we'll positively do the best work we've ever done right here in this very room. You can say that again. Hey, Marcel. Have you any absinthe at this dump? Absinthe is not permitted to be sold by law. And the Chez Marcel is not a dump. Yeah, what is it? It's a bistro. And what's a bistro? Bistro is the French for dump. Oh. <laughs> you'll go a long way before you'll find a sweller gal in Marcel. <laughs> Stands for no nonsense, either. Isn't she some relation of Britt Conway's? Well, sure. She's his great-granddaughter, just like Julie Charteris. Only the Charteris side of the family put on all the airs. Marcel runs the best dump, uh, I mean bistro, in Battenville. <laughs> Speaking of Britt Conway, have you run across those two Yankees that's been stopping at the Charteris since last Sunday? Our firm drew up the contract with them for the old lady. What contract? It's supposed to be a secret, but these men are writing a play about Britt and have paid well for the privilege. Oh, so that's how the long, outstanding charterist accounts have been settled. Mm -hmm. Hey, Marcel, come here, quick. What's the excitement, Pete? Will the planter's house burn down? No, Marcel, but get a load of this. Valerie Volupte, the black lace bombshell of burlesque, now wowing the boys in vexations of 35. Who's she? She's the wife of Mr. Kimbrough, the dame who hi-hatted me when I drove them over to the Charteris's last Sunday. You mean the wife of Kimbrough who's writing the play about great-grandfather? Sure, and it's a perfect setup for us. What is? Let's sit down and I'll explain it to you. Don't you see? These guys are down here to get the real dope on Britt and your great-grandmother, only they've gone to the wrong house. They'll never get anything out of the charters, and you can give them the real lowdown. So I walk up to Mrs. George Kimbrough, and I say, hey, babe. And she says, young man, how dare you? And then I whip out this paper. Then she faints, blackout, and where are we? Ah, but I'm still there when she comes, too. And then I say, now you listen to me, kid. And she says, what is it, honey child, being more democratic because of this paper? And I say, there's a gal in this town called Marcel Conway, and she's a real descendant of old man Britt. What's more, she's got the real lowdown on him, too. She'll sell it to you, but for big dough. Then you people can write the play, and I can act Britt Conway in it. Oh, she'll stall around a bit, and then I wave the paper in front of her face again, and she'll say, OK, pal, curtain. And then what? Then we'll be married. No, Pete. It's swell of you to dream it up, but it can't be done. Why not? I've played bigger parts than that in ten shows. I know. It's, it's not that. Well. Is it because of him? Partly. More because of her. 
Oh, now you're talking like old lady Charteris. Maybe I am, but somehow or other, I can't sell Marceline or Britt to a trick like that. Well, the Charteris side of the family have. Perhaps I have more pride about Britt's second wife than they have about his first. Well, what's pride going to get you? It's going to keep me right where I am, doing a decent job in this joint. Being looked down upon by the wise of the guys who slip down here every chance they get to have some fun and a little music and a lot of laughs. And if you want to know the real lowdown, Pete, I wouldn't trade my lot with that of Cousin Julie Charters for anything in the world. Atta girl. To Britt Conway. To Britt Conway, the most mysterious human being the world has ever known. You ain't woofing, bud. Right. Well, boys, how's it going? Splendidly. Act one, scene one. Garden of the Conway's estate. As the curtain rises, a chorus of Negroes are harmonizing Britt Conway's famous spiritual Sweet Sunday. God, I'm already yawning. Ah, but you ain't heard nothing yet. As the voices finish to thunderous applause, a magnificent specimen of young manhood emerges from the house. Passing among his faithful servitors, he uh, uh, pats a few children on the head. Just to show what side he would have been on in the Civil War had he lived that long. Well, what does he say? That's what we don't know. Oh, great. I must say, that's a fine week's work. Well, my dear, don't forget that the walls of this house reek with romance and dramatic intrigue. You remember, dear, the walls of this house may have ears, but they don't talk. It's really not our fault, Valerie. We've been completely hamstrung by the contract Mrs. Charteris made with us. We're not allowed to put anything in the play that can't be proven to have happened. And the old lady, who apparently is the only living person who can give us that proof, point blank refuses to do so. And as you very well know, compared to Madame Charteris, the Sphinx is a positive chatterbox. Well, it's up to you, Steve. What do you mean? The old lady may not talk, but the daughter will if she's given the right approach. Nonsense. Julie's a swell kid, but in the first place, she knows nothing. How do you know? George. Uh, well, I mean, uh, has Steve tried to get anything out of her in the way of information? Of course I have, but there's a certain limit. One cannot treat a southern girl as though one were a district attorney. And on the other hand, one cannot write one's play if one has nothing one can put in it, can one? One cannot. And it looks as though two cannot either. Seriously, George, I think we ought to go back to Lord Byron. Great <laughs> uh, Well, I mean to say, I think that Steve and I ought to have one more go at licking the Conway proposition. Well, all right, boys. But if we don't get anything out of the committee meeting this afternoon... Gee, I forgot. I look awful. I have to change my dress. Do we have to go downstairs? I can think of nothing drearier than a group of club women laboriously discussing how to make this year's Brit Conway Festival more lugubrious than last year. We certainly do have to go downstairs. And furthermore, here's our plan of campaign. I shall dazzle the club ladies and endeavor to extract something from them. Steve, you concentrate on Julie Charteris and George... What can George do? I shall commune with Shakespeare. I'm sure I can get something out of him, if there's any left. What's uh, that? Who's that now? Probably the ghost of Brett Conway. <clears throat> oh, come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that... Nonsense, my dear child. Come right in. What a perfectly charming dress. <laughs> it's exactly like the one I came out in. Remember, George? The only dress I ever saw you come out in was the one you came out of in the follies of Let Me See uh, That. Come on, George. We must tidy ourselves up, mustn't we? And when do your dear mother's charming guests arrive? Well, the meeting begins at 4.30. That's what I came here to tell you. Oh, then we must rush. Steve, aren't you lucky you don't get all messed up and untidy the way George does? Of course, George does work much harder. Of course. Now, I should go and help Liza Henry with the lemonade. Nonsense, my dear child. Now, you two young people stay right here and have a cozy little chat. Get Steve to show you how his model theater works. It's perfectly fascinating, isn't it, George? Isn't it, George? Oh, uh, yes, of course, if you have anything to play in it. <laughs> Are you sure I haven't interrupted your work? Well, of course not. Anyway, there's nothing I can work at. Oh, 
I thought writers just sat down and wrote. Let's in on a little secret, Miss Julie. Unless they have something to inspire them, writers just sit down, period. And you have nothing to inspire you here. I have enough inspiration right here for at least a dozen love sonnets, but not about Britt Conway. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. As a matter of fact, in the past week, I've been inspired to write one little thing. Oh, really? I'd like to see how we work out love scenes in our little model theater? I'd love to. Swell. You stand over here. You'll be the audience. I'll work out the set. What are you going to use for scenery? Well, here's the tree. Here's the well. Now all you need are the actors. There they are, right here on this bench. And you work out the love scenes right here on the stage? Mm-hmm. Here's where the boy and girl have the inevitable little quarrel. We're going to do this and dance for them. Quarrel? Well, just a lover's misunderstanding. When this happens, the boy's very hurt. That he's falling in love. Well, what does happen? You'll see. so much fun when they make up. That's a better finish, isn't it? Miss Julie, the ladies are beginning to arrive now. I done told Miss Charters that you always help me with the lemonade. I can't keep on saying that. Y'all better come downstairs now. Won't you sit down, ladies? My daughter will be here immediately. Excuse me. You, I believe, are Miss Lanning? Indeed I am. Indeed I am. Well, isn't that nice? Oh, I can't tell you how proud I am, Mrs. Charters, to become social editor of the Battenville Gazette. Of course, I realize it's a tremendous responsibility, but I promise you that I intend to make the fame of my column ring throughout the entire South. I'm sure you will. Of course, we in Battenville were very fond of poor Hattie Cunningham, your predecessor. Yes. 
Whatever she wrote was in the best taste. Oh, indeed it was. And I can't tell you how distressed I was when I heard that after all those years of faithful service, they had to take her off to a mental home. That, Miss Lanning, is something we don't discuss in Battenville. Oh, there's that darling Miss Pape. I... Oh, excuse me. You're late, Julie. I know, Mother. I'm so sorry. Oh, how do you do, Miss Calhoun? I'm so glad you could come. I'd like you to know Stephen Morse. How do you do? He's writing a play about great-grandfather, you know. Excuse me? We're all mighty proud of Britt Conway in Bathville, Mr. Mark. have we here? The nectar of the gods? I don't know nothing about no nectar, but this here's lemonade punch. I can smell the lemonade, but where's the punch? Miss Charter, she don't approve of no punch in lemonade punch. Quite right of Mrs. Charteris. Sure ain't no job for just one pair of hands. How right you are. Let me help you. Oh, Miss Charters, well, she would have a righteous fit if she seed any of the guests helping the help. Well, I tell you what, then. I'll stay in here and mix the punch, just to keep it nice and cool while you go on out and serve the food. You're sure kind, Mr. Kimbrew. We appreciate your help. Heaven helps those who help themselves. Drink to me only with thine eyes, and I will pledge with mine. Mr. Mont, at this meeting, we intend to discuss the annual Brit Conway Festival intelligently and soberly. As a girl. George, dear. Yes, darling. How do I look, darling? It's simple, but somehow I think it has chick. Oh, it's a knockout. Yeah, I'll see it is. What have you been doing hanging around that punch bowl? Uh, waiting for you, my love, because I wanted to make my entrance with the best looking woman in the place. Well, if that's intended as a compliment, take a look at what's inside. Get a lot of Lady Macbeth. Yes, but Mrs. Charter was as outdone Shakespeare. What do you mean? There were only three witches in Macbeth. Ladies, I want you to meet Mr. and Mrs. George Kimbrough. What a clever idea of yours, Mrs. Kimbrough, to come to the meeting dressed for the festival. <laughs> oh, what a delightful bon mot. <laughs> uh, oh, I must write that down for the Gazette. Mr. Mott, how did it go? Right over everybody's head. <laughs> oh, you're all so brilliant and witty. Poor little me. I feel quite out of it. <laughs> oh, not at all. Uh, Liza, did you give Miss Lanning some lemonade? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Mott. <laughs> Liza Henry's lemonade punch is famous in Battenville, I'm told. Oh, really? Yes, ma'am. I reckon this lemonade punch is going to make history. Why so pensive, Miss Julie? The lovers did get together, didn't they? The end of the band. Lovers always do if they're honest with each other. Yes, I know, but you can't yes, always... Yes, you can. If you're truly in love, as these two are. How do you know they are? I'm the author, and the characters in my play are not truly imaginary. <laughs> oh, there you are, dear Mr. Mon. This is the most delicious punch. Oh, silly me. Punch. <laughs> In my opinion, this year's Brit Conway Festival should be conspicuous above all for its dignity. Precisely. Oh, thank you. I will. Some lemonade, darling? No, thank you. For once, I'd like a real drink and a stiff one at that. I'm perfectly satisfied with this. Oh, Mr. Kimbrough, that delightful Mr. Mont has just told me that you and he are writing a most fascinating play about our own Britt Conway. I'm Miss Lanning. Oh, Mrs. Kimbrough, I do hope you're going to allow me to describe your scrumptious gown in the Battenville Gazette on Sunday, perhaps. Somehow or other on Sunday, they allow us to be just a little more, how shall I put it, uh, risque? If Battenville can take it, I can. 
Oh, and Mr. Kimbrough, I suppose Mrs. Charters has told you all the details of Britt Conway's fascinating life story? Oh, yes. Mrs. Charters has confided in me, confidentially, of course, oh, that Britt Conway was born, was married, and died. I was even able to wheedle the dates out of her. Oh, how fascinating. And I suppose you were able to obtain material from the other Conway descendants? Who's that? Oh, a young woman by the name of Marcel Conway. She runs a, oh, how shall I put it, a cafe in the other part of town, of course. It seems that Britt had a, uh, oh, how shall I put it, a romance with a girl's great-grandmother. After his first wife died, of course, Britt Conway was a gentleman. And where did you say this young lady lives? Oh, I wouldn't know that, really. We young ladies of, uh, how shall I put it, uh, breeding, <laughs> never patronize a place of that, uh, how shall I put it, um... Ilk. Uh, just so. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and now, ladies, I think it's time for the committee meeting to commence. George, you stay here. I'm slipping out. Can't take it anymore, huh? Well, I don't blame you. Somehow I'm going to find this Marcel Conway girl. Wonder where she hangs out. Why don't you ask my boyfriend, Pete? He knows everything. Pete? Yeah, you know the boy at the hotel. The one who thought he knew you when. The first bright idea you've had in a week. Now listen, I'll take Steve and we'll find this dame if it takes all night. You stay here and amuse these ghouls. Amuse them? I'll have them rolling in the aisles. Let's forget about tomorrow or yesterday. This magic we're sharing will live through the night. Oh, beast, exquisite, my dear child. She's lovely, isn't she, though? Say, folks, how would she be playing her own great-grandmother opposite me as Brit? Well, who ever told you my husband would cast you as Brit? Well, it's like this, Miss Belufty. <sighs> you see, it's just like I said, only she forgot to say. Young man, how dare you? I'm sorry, Mrs. Kimbrell. I told Pete not to play that trick on you. How did you know? Stage and sports, black lace bombshell, vexations, 1935. Oh. Well, I want you to know I was the greatest fan dancer on 42nd Street. I used to come out in a little black lace job. Of course, I never used swing. I always had my own music. Classy stuff, you know. I used to start out with a little, just a little teeny bump. And then I really got going. And by the time I hit center stage, yeah. Oh, uh, Miss Conway, this young man uh, brought us around here because we understand that you're a lineal descendant of the divine Brit Conway, about who, about whom my husband is writing a play. And you want the real dope on great-grandfather. I'll say we do. Your cousins, the Charteris family, may be very excellent people, but they seem to know remarkably little about their own ancestor. Yeah, and what they do know, they're not telling. I'm sorry, but I'm not selling ancestors this year. Oh, that's too bad. That means that George and Steve will be forced to use the rather dull story provided by Mrs. Charteris. Dull? Why, the fellow was dynamite. You bet he was. Well, not according to your cousin Julie. She paints him as a saintly boar whose only romance was a rather insipid Victorian courtship of her great-grandmother. That's a lie. Britt had one great romance, and that was with Marceline. Well, there were other romances in his life, but his first wife probably meant less to him than any of them. He didn't fight duels over her as he did over Marceline. And he didn't write love songs to her, but he did to my great-grandmother. He wrote a song to Marceline? Sure he did. Valerie, this is something else Mrs. Charteris hasn't given us. We don't need her now. Miss Conway, would you... I'm sorry. I wish I could help you. But you can. You have Britt's song. Pete, you mustn't. Now we're getting somewhere. Here it is. Just as I saw you the first time, you're still a part of my heart. Valerie, this is terrific. Just what we've been looking for. It's perfect for the finale. Brit, piano, singing to Marceline. Please, I'm... Mr. Mont, I know I can play Brit for you. I know you will be pleased to hear that those eminent men of letters Mr. George Kimbrough and Mr. Stephen Monk. Woo! I'd like him for Christmas. <laughs> Have kindly consented to supervise this year's Brit Conway. 
vegetable. since I was a bootlegger in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Well, come on, kids. Is there anything left to tidy up? Only Miss Calhoun. Looks to me like she's gonna be here to Judgment Day. I can't understand what could have gotten into Mother's gift. I can. So can I. What is the meaning of this? How dare you bring this woman into my house? Well, from the looks of your guest, you should be flattered to receive anybody who can still stand up. Introducing the contestants in tonight's main event. On my right, battling Charteris. On my left, Kid Kimbrough. Be quiet, George. This is serious. We found Marcel Conway, a real descendant of Brits. Well, I'm very happy to know you. How do you do? Any luck? She can tell you the true story of Britt Conway. Yeah, and it's a pip. Miss Conway can tell you any story she chooses to fabricate, Mr. Kimber, but not in my house. I've no reason to invent a story about Britt Conway and my great-grandmother, and I've no reason to conceal anything. I'm proud of her. And i will be obliged if you'll take your pride and your gossip back to the disreputable place you run, wherever it is. Mother, please. Mrs. Charteris, can't we sit down and discuss this thing rationally? There's nothing further to discuss. Oh, yes, there is. We made a contract with you to tell us everything about Britt Conway. You took our dough and didn't deliver. Naughty, naughty. That doesn't excuse you from bringing an unwelcome guest to my house. Mrs. Charters is right. Even the lowest joints have the right to refuse service. I'm sorry. If Miss Conway goes, we're going to. That's right. That's your privilege, Mr. Monk. But before you go, may I remind you that by our agreement, you're forbidden to put anything in your play about Britt Conway that cannot be proved in writing. Would it be too much to expect of Southern hospitality to see that our bags are packed and sent to the planter's house where we shall be taking up residence? Pete? Yeah, I know. You want me to take down all that junk you hung up upstairs. What do you mean, junk? That's priceless batique. Have it your own way, bombshell. Steve. George, Marcel, dear, since none of us are welcome in this house, we'll wait outside until Pete comes downstairs. You know, George, I think I'll hang the drapes in here before I put the batik over my bed. Oh, Valerie, why bother about drapes and batiks at a time like this? Why not? You boys are all set now, thanks to me. Marcel gave you enough material for three operettas. Incidentally, I think she'd be swell as Marceline. Well, what's the good of that, Valerie? You heard what Mrs. Charteris said. Unless we have proof in writing, she'll never give her consent. Don't be too sure. Get a look at this. Plans for Brit Conway Festival by Eurydice Lanning. Society editor. At the magnificent home of the genial Mrs. Ambrose Charteris and her delightful daughter, known to her intimates as Miss Julie, the advisory committee for the Brit Conway Festival was royally entertained on Tuesday afternoon. The food was sumptuous and the punch was pernicious. The highlight of a remarkable afternoon was the announcement by our hostess that this year the festival will be supervised by none other than those two celebrated Broadway dramatists. Mr. George Kimbrough and Mr. Stephen Mott. What's so wonderful about that? Well, you didn't finish it. 
The cooperation of the two famous authors who are preparing a play on the life of Brick Conway based on the intimate details of his life, as recounted by Mrs. Tartarus, guarantees that the festival will be the most successful in the annual series. And for this, we have to thank Battenville's leading citizeness and social light, Mrs. Ambrose Charteris. Ho, oh, ho! What difference will that make? Obviously, you've never lived in a small town. Hey, folks, guess who's here? Miss Julie? No, no, the old dragon herself. How nice of you to drop by, Mr. Charteris. Uh, won't you sit down? Thank you, I will. I'm not as young as I was. We've just been reading about you in the Battenville Gazette. Yes. It was because of that I came here. The Lanning woman is obviously mentally defective. But the fact remains this idiotic article has placed me and my daughter in a most difficult position. How true, how true. I have no intention of mincing words. I was guilty on Tuesday of an unpardonable breach of etiquette under, I must say, extremely provoking circumstances. You ordered us out of your house. That's not quite true. We offered to leave, and Mrs. Charteris agreed. Let us say that I acted hastily. To put my cards on the table, I need you to ensure the success of the festival. And in what way do we need you? I happened to be rummaging in an old bureau today, and I found some papers in Britt Conway's handwriting. Unpaid bills, no doubt. On the contrary, they contain what I believe you Broadway people refer to as some hot stuff. So the deal is, we come to the festival, you give out the dirt. That is so. It's a deal. Okay by me. Uh-uh. On one condition, Mrs. Charteris. My husband and Mr. Martin are being complete charge of the festival, including the songs that are sung and danced. Provided they're genuine songs by my grandfather. Oh, they'll be the real McCoy. And over the choice of performers. You mean? Those are my terms. Take it or leave it. You leave me no alternative. I accept. I can only say this of you, Mrs. Kimbra. You represent the triumph of mind over manners. Bye.
Gentlemen, it had been my intention to have thanked Mr. Kimber and Mr. Mon on behalf of my grandfather, Britt Conway, for the performance here tonight. But I find I am unable to do so because the exhibition we have just witnessed in no way represents the character and ethical point of view of my illustrious ancestor. Oh, but it does. I... And I warn these gentlemen that if they dare to perform what we have just seen in New York or anywhere else, I shall sue them for vilifying the character of Britt Conway. What do you know about Britt's point of view character? I have no intention of entering a public debate. That's because you're afraid to. I'm not. You and your daughter are ashamed of Britt. Oh, you look smug when his name is mentioned. But you're scared to be proud of him as he really was. If you think he was great in your careful way, I'm telling you he was twice as great the other side of town. Speak a little slower, will you, dear? I'm a bit rusty on my shorthand. That's all. Can't waste any more time. I'm going back to the Chez Marcel where your husbands, that is, if any of you ladies are lucky enough to have husbands, are probably waiting to have a drink and some laughs with me. I'm sorry, Steve, if I've messed up the chances for your play. Well, that's all right. Julie. Yes, Mama. Finally escort me to the house. I must remind you, Mrs. Charteris, we made a little deal with you the other day at the hotel. I advise you to consult with my lawyers about that. And what about the Britt Conway papers you promised us? <laughs> Your memory must be playing you tricks, Mr. Kimbrough. Good evening to you. Steve, there's something I must tell you. I'm afraid there's nothing you could tell me, Miss Charteris, that I'd believe. Come on, let's go to Marcel's place. We need some fresh air. Walking around and moping, honey, won't do no good. Don't you want to come over and cut for your wish? Might come out. I wish I were dead. When you tell your wishes, they don't come true. I tell you, Miss Julie, what we'll do. We'll make it your fortune instead. Look, honey. Now, here's how your fortune starts. Now, this here's your picture, the Queen of Hearts. Look at how she frowns. That means your heart is aching. And if I ain't mistaken, it's on account of this here Jack. I do believe it's Mr. Steve. Miss Julie, honey, the reason why you're feeling bad is cause you holding back something he ought to have. This two of hearts. Now, that means a man and woman's story. A man and woman that long ago been gone to glory. I reckon it's about Mr. Britt. Miss Julie, you just won't admit to Mr. Steve your grandpa was a natural man. And honey, ever since the world began, men folks has been men folks. Don't you understand? Well, that story would bring shame on the family name. Well, there ain't many men the Lord picked out to write real music. The Lord is forgiven of mistakes a man like that that made in living. And if it's Mr. Britt's life you begrudging, then, honey, you cause yourself better judging than the good Lord himself. You're right, Liza Henry. I must get Britt's diary to him. But how? I don't want Steve to think I'm chasing him. <laughs> 
I guess the Lord will forgive me for what I did. So here's the old diary. And for oh. hiding. Oh. I'm amply provided. <laughs> Boy, I'd have given anything to have heard you give that old dragon the works. It was a dumb thing to do, really. The boys lost the chance to do the play, and now I won't be able to show people what Marceline was really like. Yeah, and Broadway will never see me as Britt Conway. I know. It's tough on you, Pete. It's tougher on Broadway. Guess I'll have to go back to the trapeze act. <laughs> Is there anything you haven't been? Yeah, married. But we'll fix that, won't we, honey? Excuse me. Marcel, I had to come to see you. Why? I have something for you. I can get along quite nicely without hush money, thank you. Oh, no, it's not that. Anyway, I don't have any money. Marcel, I have to speak to you. Privately. Privately meaning without me? Pete, would you mind running downstairs? Yeah, I know. I've played these scenes with ten shows. Why did you come here? I want you to give that to Mr. Mont. This looks like the real thing. It is. Handwriting's the same. Here's all about the first time he and Marceline met. Why did you bring this to me? Why not to Steve himself? Because, oh, I can't begin to explain, and, and you wouldn't understand. But please, please promise me one thing, that you'll never, never tell Steve, Mr. Mott, that you got it from me. Will you promise? It's a deal, Cousin Julie. Thanks. Marcel, please believe me. I. I must go. Do you know what I believe? For the first time, I believe that Britt Conway really did marry your great grandmother. Thanks. Oh. Oh, well, thanks anyway. <laughs> I suddenly realized that it was written not for me, but for Marceline. You can deceive with words, but melody cannot lie. No, Valerie. Try and get a little real feeling into it. You're supposed to be a dame who suddenly discovered that the boy she loves has gone sour on her. If these ridiculous words you've written, there's no poetry in them. As, for instance? As, for instance, as you were singing your song. Well, what's wrong with that? Except the way you sang it. An artiste does not sing a song. She renders it. I'm right, aren't I, Steve? What? Oh, sorry. Afraid I wasn't paying attention. That's been the trouble ever since we left Battenville. You'll pay attention to nothing, contribute nothing, do nothing except play that one tune that you won't even let us use in the show. Yes, Steve. Why can't I sing that song? You mean, render it, Valerie, dear. Sorry, Valerie, but no. The song isn't right for you. It's a song, a song for... For, for Miss Julie, I suppose. The precious Miss Julie, who did her darndest to keep us from doing this show. If we're going to open Thursday, we'd better get on with the rehearsal. Sorry, George, haven't been much help to you lately. No, that's all right. Say, by the way, I saw the rest of Marcel's costumes this morning. They're terrific. They should be. Being a heck of a mess if it weren't for Marcel. Now, where were we? Playing songs for Miss Julie, raving about Marcel's costumes, completely ignoring your leading lady. Okay. We'll go to your next entrance. Act two, scene three. Valerie, this is where you come down the stairs. There are no stairs in this set. I know, my love, but if you have an ounce of imagination or even a modicum of memory, Try and picture the Charter's household and imagine yourself walking down the steps. Well, if there's one thing I do know, it's how to walk. All right. The chorus has just finished the reprise of Sweet Sunday. Take a split second for the applause and then walk down quite simply, stage center. Off we go. Oh, 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 what have I done to deserve this? You've written a very silly play, and what's wrong anyhow? 
I said walk, not slither, slide, and squirm all over the place. You're supposed to be a southern lady, not a snake charmer at Coney. Listen, George Kimbrough, and listen good. I did plenty okay with fans and bubbles and doves, and long after your gallant balladeers back in the warehouse, I'll still be waving a fan, see? I shall now retire to my dressing room until you are ready to render your apology. Much as I admire my grandfather's compositions, don't you get a little tired of hearing that same tune all day long? I like it, Mama. Oh, thank you, Liza Henry. Let me come back in a little while and clear the tea things away. Yes, sir. What's the matter, Miss Julie? Ain't my molasses cookies good this time? Oh, they're delicious. I'm just not hungry, that's all. We ain't had enough to keep us fair alive since Mr. Steve left. Why, Julie, there's a letter from your Uncle Horace in New York. Isn't that nice? Can this be? Gallant Balladeer, new operetta based on the life of Britt Conway. On Thursday next at the Monarch Theater, Gilbert Wilson will present a new work from the prolific pens of George Kimbrough and Stephen Mont. The story of this musical is based on authentic data found in a diary written by Britt Conway himself. This diary was discovered only recently by the enterprising authors while visiting descendants of the famous Southern Balladeer in Battenville, Louisiana. There can only be one answer to this. Liza Henry must have been bribed for those creatures. That's not true. I took the diary. I gave it to you. My daughter. No, Mama. Britt Conway's great-granddaughter. Oh, Mama, I know how you feel. But times are changing. It isn't that people are any less strict in their standards. It's, well, it's just that they're more human, more understanding. Nonsense. Humanity and understanding are modern words for laxity, sloppy sentimentality. I presume you've temporarily taken leave of your senses. Until you recover them, go to your room and remain there. Ladder's house? Yeah? Yeah, this is Pete. Who are you? Julie. Oh, Miss Julie Charteris. Why, yes, Miss Julie. I guess I know most everything. Where could you pawn an antique music box? Now, let me see. Why, yes, sure I know. I think after 15 years it would get better, but it doesn't. Remind me to close my eyes when Valerie makes that entrance down the staircase. <laughs> I shall have passed quietly out long before that. Say, there's John Furbank of Morning Courier. Give an ear and find out what kind of a mood he's in. I'm so nervous I've gone stone deaf. Okay. I feel I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> What's wrong, dear? Never should have eaten those oysters. Well? Never again. Oh, it's ten past nine already. We'll never get there before the end of the play. It's tough on you, Miss Julie, but I guess it'll run more than one night. Even if I'm not playing Brett Conway, Attention, northbound passage for New York. The bus has been repaired and is now ready to leave. Well, when will we get to New York? Your bus will arrive at the 42nd Street Terminal at approximately 10.55 p.m. Take your seats, please. Yes. 
about you. I wanted to tell you, Marcel, that if it hadn't been for you, the show never could have gone on at all. I'm good, Steve, but not that good. I meant the diary. If you hadn't found it for us, there never would have been a gallant balladeer. Steve, dear, I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to break a promise. A promise? I didn't find that diary. Julie Chargers brought it to me and made me promise I wouldn't tell you where it came from. Julie? But why? Because she's in love with you, you dumb cluck, and she got it into her head that you and I are in love. Which is silly, because apart from knowing that you and Julie are, Pete and I are. Get ready for the finale, Miss Conway. You got a couple hundred bucks on you, George? Just about. Give it to me. Why? You people aren't enjoying the show. Keep quiet so that others can. Sorry, I've got to get to Battenville right away. You mean before the show is over? What difference does the show make? This is important. Give me the doll. I was going to take Valerie to supper on this. Oh, well, Valerie eats too much anyway. Will you keep quiet? I'm very sorry. Say, Steve. girlfriend, Marcel, taking her call. Is she gorgeous? Sure. Who's that guy taking a call with her? For Conway, of course. Boy, is he corny. Told you you'd enjoy it. Excellent. Uh, excellent. What's that music they're playing? I like it. Oh, it's not in the show. It wasn't written for the public. A song for Miss Julie. <laughs> 